As we begin our worship tonight, will you join me in the reading of our opening sentences from the second letter to the Corinthians, the fifth chapter and the 17th verse. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. It is our prayer this week that God will continue to make us new. With that in mind, let us sing together our revival theme song. Well, it's, the bulletin says we'll sing it twice. We'll only sing it one time through. Make me new, Lord. Make me new, Lord. Restore me by your fourth night of our services or fourth time in revival services and it's good that everyone is here we're especially glad to have you if you're one of our guests members you look around we see many who are visiting with us again this evening make sure you make them feel welcome before we leave here this evening let's pray together God as we continue to come to you this week seeking your face and desiring your will we pray that this evening you might speak to us anew that we might open our hearts and our lives to you that we might respond to what your spirit urges us to do, that we might become the vessel that you can use. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you take a hymnal and turn with us as we praise our God together, singing our hymn of praise, Come Christians, join to sing. We'll sing the first and the last stanza, hymn number two, 31. Let's stand as we sing. take your worship bulletin and join me as we read together our scripture reading which has been our scripture reading this week let's read this passage from second chronicles together if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God's promises are sure because our God is faithful. We sing that hymn that is one of my favorites and I'm sure one of yours. 
hymn number 54, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We'll sing again the first and the last stanza. Faithful and true and trustworthy has called us to follow, to put our trust in those promises, and to go wherever the Master calls us, wherever the Master leads. May it be our prayer that we will follow when the Master comes to us and calls us to follow.
thank you, Handbells. We appreciate what you add to our worship. Mark, we appreciate everything you're doing to lead us as we worship this week. We'll sing a hymn medley of prayer and fellowship. We'll begin with hymn number 445, Sweet Hour of Prayer. We'll sing the first verse of each of these four hymns. Let's stand as we sing. receive our offering tonight in each of the services of our revival. Let me remind you that the offering we take each night will go to help offset the costs of conducting this revival. Let us pray together. O creator, redeemer, and sustainer, what shall we bring to you? Already the earth is yours. What shall we give to you? 
Already you have given life to us. So we give to you that which you require of us, our best. We give the best of our money and not simply what is left over. We give the best of our talents, striving for excellence in ministry and mission. We give the best of our hearts, our compassion, our commitment, our love for you and one another. Bless these gifts that we offer this hour and all the hours of our days. In the name of our Lord, who gave himself, we pray. Amen. This evening again is my pleasure to welcome Reverend Stephen Earle to our pulpit. Stephen is the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Ponca City, Oklahoma, of course is a native of Middlesbrough, and I know that he feels very encouraged and affirmed by many of you who've come to hear him these past few evenings, those who have had relationship with him in the past, and I know that he'll want to thank you also, and we appreciate you coming and worshiping with us and also coming to hear Stephen. And after the choir sings their anthem, Stephen will come to bring our message.
Marshall Gabriel, a black preacher, was the best friend I had, minister friend, during the years I served in Northwest Ohio. Uh, Marshall and I met at some uh, meeting. I don't remember exactly what the context of it was, but come to find out, he had been raised in Toledo, Ohio, and pastored his first church in Middlesbrough, Kentucky. And I, of course, had been raised in Middlesbrough, Kentucky, and was pastoring my first church in Perrysburg, which is a suburb of Toledo. With that uh, connection, Marshall and I shared a lot about Toledo and Middlesbrough, and our friendship just grew and grew. And one night, he and Lucy, his wife, were at our house for dinner. And they were talking about Toledo. Marshall had grown up, grown up there, of course. And uh, we were young and naive. It was my first church and didn't know a lot about some of the city ways. And so he and Lucy decided that they would take us to a red light district uh, after dinner. And about 11 o'clock that evening, which is way beyond my bedtime, uh, we got in Marshall's nice new white Cadillac and drove down to the red light district in Toledo. And I was shocked, really. There were people standing out, busy place, cars, ladies waving at us. You know? I mean, it was, <laughs> it was unusual. I'd never been there before. And at any rate, we were driving along, very busy section, cars going back and forth, people walking across the street. And Marshall said, oh, there's the answer to my question. And I said, what? He said, that sign answered my question. And in front of us was a no U-turn sign. And I said, what's the question, Marshall? He said, Stephen, the question is, do I go straight? And the answer, no, U-turn. And with that, he made a huge U-turn right in the middle of the four lanes of traffic in Toledo. Every time I see a no U-turn sign, I think of Marshall Gabriel, and I ask the question, do I go straight? Second Chronicles 7.14 is God's answer to some of our basic questions. Do we continue to go as we always have, even though it isn't working? Do we hold on to our old prejudices and values without any consideration for what God has to say? Do we just carry on as we always have? And God's answer is very clear. No, you turn. Sunday morning, we talked about healing the land recognizing the need and realizing who can heal the land. Sunday evening we talked about that big word if, the possibility of revival and responsibility to bring about revival. And last night we talked about humbling ourselves and praying for there can never be revival without humility and prayer. This evening we come to that difficult phrase, turn from their wicked ways. The first word, turn, is the basic word for repentance. And it is not reformation. It is not for a person who's trying to redo their life necessarily. It is not a person who is sorry because they got caught doing wrong. It suggests a permanent turning away from self, selfishness, and sin and turning toward God. And many so-called or really religious people have never made that choice. There are numerous individuals who have decided it is better to be in the church or decided it is better to live a wholesome life. But as far as deliberately, decisively, conscientiously, consciously deciding to permanently, permanently turn toward God and accept his way and his will and his word, there are numerous people who haven't done that yet. And that's what this suggests. Those who will turn from their ways to God's way. When I was the pastor at First Baptist Church Perrysburg, the Carter family were members and fine members of our congregation. And Mr. and Mrs. Carter were out of town one weekend and they left their teenage daughter, Diana, at home alone. And she did what many young people do when they're left home alone. She invited a, numerous, a number of her friends in and they had a party. And it wasn't the kind of party that Ezra Carter would have approved of. And he found out about it. Strict disciplinary measures were taken. They were so upset with Diana. And on Sunday morning, the following week, during the invitation, a charade took place, really. Diana walked down the aisle, took me by the hand, 
expressed her sorrow for what she had done and said she wanted to rededicate her life. Well, her mom and dad were delighted, of course. She's seen the light. And they relaxed, just what she wanted them to do, by the way. They relaxed their disciplinary measures. Heat was off. But Diana made no real change. Her attitudes remained the same. Her behavior remained the same. She wasn't sorry for what she had done. She was sorry she got caught for what she had done. And in many instances, that's where we find ourselves with God as his children. We are not sorry for the things we do. We are sorry when we get caught for the things we do. And real repentance is not being sorry for those sins alone or trying to get the heat off. Repentance is permanently turning from our way to God's way. Turn from their wicked ways. Look at the word wicked for a moment. You could probably list on your hand the number of people you would call wicked. We think of people in dark alleys, maybe dressed in dark clothing at night, doing things that are unmentionable. And if you should name all the wicked people you know, none of them would probably be in First Baptist Church or perhaps any other church. It seems rather odd that God's word, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which has that phrase, turn from their wicked ways, is directed toward his people. As a matter of fact, in the days those words were written, uh, the people of Israel were very good. If a sociologist, if there had been one in those days, had observed the people of Israel and the surrounding nations, they would have said, these are the best people around. Their moral standards are higher than any others. As a matter of fact, many pagans turned to the people of Israel and became Israelites by proselyte because they wanted to embrace their teachings about God. They liked their human rights issues. They liked their moral standards. And so many pagans became Jews. They weren't really Jews at that time. They were still called Hebrews. But they became Hebrews because they liked what they saw and heard. And they were better people. And yet God said to these very good people, Unless you, who are very good, turn from your wicked ways. For wickedness has a lot more to do with what's in the heart than it does any act or series of actions. Well, the same is true of the church, really. Recently, there was an article in Psychology Today that said uh, church people are about half as likely to be delinquent, to commit suicide, to divorce, to abuse alcohol and drugs as people who are not in the church. And one author said that they have discovered that people who are in the church regularly are twice as likely to list themselves as very happy over people who are outside the church. And in addition to that, people in the church live longer than people who are outside the church. And yet God's word to us as it was to the people of Israel my people we cannot expect the world to turn from their wicked ways they have they're powerless to do it by the way the only way that the world has any hope is when we the people of god turn from our wicked ways which has to do with the heart jeremiah says the heart is deceitfully wicked who can know it the psalmist cried out search me o lord and see if there is any wicked way in me How often have you prayed that prayer? Jesus said, it is from within. From man's heart that evil comes. It is from within the heart of man that there are wicked thoughts and evil deeds originate. And one of those verses that you learned, those of you who took the Fresh Encounter series out of the book of Hebrews, it says, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you a wicked unbelieving heart leading you to stray away from the living God. Wickedness in the heart. There's a a psychologist by the name of Scott Peck. Some of you may have read his works, two very popular books he wrote years ago. One of them was called uh, The Road Less Traveled and the other is called People of the Lie. When he wrote the book The Road Less Traveled, he was not a Christian. but it is a widely read book, even by Christians. Scott Peck decided there was no psychology of evil. That psychologists deal with illnesses, 
emotional disturbances, mental disturbances, and disorders. And there was no real idea of evil in the psychological world. And so he wanted to find out, is there anything such as evil? Is this just a word in the church? Or is there really an evil force in the world? And he began to do his research. And during the process of his research, by the way, he became a Christian because he recognized that aside from mental disorders and emotional disturbances, there is really a force at work in their world and in the hearts and minds of people that is evil. And the only way to conquer that force is through the power of God by faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Scott Peck became a Christian in the process of his study. But this is what he had to say. In doing in all of this research, he discovered that some of the most evil people were not behind bars in prisons. He said, I found them in churches. They were hiding behind the cloak of godliness. They looked good. They said the right words. But by slander and innuendo, they cut other people down and hurt others. He said, I was shocked to discover that that evil force that undermines the good men and women would do is found in people inside churches on church rolls. Reminds me of the word of Jesus to the Pharisees, who were the best of all people, prayed regularly, washed their hands always before they eat, observed all the laws. Jesus said, you are like whitewashed tombs, full of dead men's bones on the inside. Wickedness. It's a matter of a heart. Turn permanently from wicked ways. The word way is suggestive of a lifestyle, a permanent way of going, by the way. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, you discover that one of the first ways they described Christianity was the way, because it was different than the way other people lived. Jesus said there is a broad way where many people enter in and it leads to death and a very narrow way few people find and it leads to life. Do you know Jeff I've been in a number of cities and I have never seen a narrow way on a street in death. Most towns have a broad way. I'm very familiar with Broadway Baptist Church, Broadway Methodist Church. I have never seen narrow way Baptist Church. Have you? Can't you imagine that? First Baptist Church changed the name. Narrow Way Baptist Church, Middlesbrough, Kentucky. It might not be a bad idea for the name of a church, you know. For our Lord said that is the only way to get in. It's a straight and narrow way. The Old Testament writer said, there is a way that appears right to a man, but the end is the way of death. The psalmist said, God knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked shall perish. The president of the greater Milwaukee YMCA said to a gathering of young men one day, Watch your thoughts, for they become your words. Watch your words, for they will become your actions. Watch your actions, for they will become your habits. Watch your habits, for they will become your character. Watch your character, for it will become your destiny. God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, their hidden attitudes, those impurities in their thoughts and in their hearts turn from their wicked ways permanently. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. So, do we continue to live as we have? Do we continue to pursue the same sources of entertainment we always have? Do we continue to think the same way and embrace our values and our career goals without any thought of what God has to say? And even more closer to home, do we depart 
from this building tonight the same way we entered. God's word is clear. No, you turn. Will you make your turn toward him tonight? Stand with me, please, for the invitation. We sing again hymn 294. Hymn 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. In just a moment, your pastor will be standing here in the front to greet those who would like to come. If you have the need to come kneel in this altar and pray for yourself or for someone else, please feel free to do that. You may do so and walk back to your seat. You may take your pastor by the hand and ask him to pray with you for you or for someone else. You may come and find counsel how you can trust Christ as your Savior and have your sins forgiven and permanently turn toward God. You can come to make a reaffirmation of your faith, a recommitment of your life to serve him. Or you can come to join this church, embrace the values of the people here, and serve God in this community. As he speaks to you and says, tonight is your night, you come while we sing, will you?
as the instruments continue to play and the choir continues to sing, the invitation is still open for you. There are several people who have responded to the invitation tonight. Perhaps there are others who would like to, but for some reason have hesitated. You need not be a member of First Baptist Church. You may come here frequently. You may have never been in this building before. But this is God's invitation. It is an invitation for all of those who have never made a decision of faith and come to know Christ in the free pardon of sin. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You may need to make a decision to trust Christ, to recommit your life to him, or to bring a burden for a lost person with you to pray here with your pastor on this altar. But if God's speaking to you, there's still time, and we invite you to come. We'll sing another stanza of the invitation. This is for you. If you'd like to come, but for some reason have hesitated, you come now, will you? celebrate with these who've come tonight to make rededications of their life, to pray for family members, to pray for friends, to pray for those that they care for, to come, many saying, I don't even know what to pray, but I know God wants to use me and wants to use my life, and I want to open myself up to God. We thank you for coming and making these public decisions, because by coming, it becomes more concrete to you, and it encourages us to also recommit our lives. I hope you'll be back tomorrow night, for we truly believe that God is sending revival in this place, 
and we hope you'll be back as we worship again tomorrow evening. Let me remind you that tomorrow we will have our fellowship meal at 5.30 before we come up to worship. And we invite everyone to come and be a part of that tomorrow evening. Let's pray together. God, we still ourselves in your presence, for we know that you are in our midst. We've seen it in the way that people have responded. We've seen it on faces as they come wanting to walk closer to you. We've heard it in the cries of those who are praying for loved ones, wanting others to come to know you as Savior, Lord. Tonight, as we leave this place, we pray, Lord, that you would encourage us in these new commitments, that you would give us the power to live our lives for you. And Lord, we pray for others who also need to make decisions throughout our community. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us to be your messengers to proclaim that wonderful good news of love and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening and welcome once again to worship at First Baptist Church and welcome to tonight the fifth in our series of revival services. It is our prayer that you will be blessed for having worshiped with us tonight as we come together seeking God's face. We begin tonight by singing two hymns of praise, both of which acknowledge the victory that Jesus has provided for us. 
These two hymns, while written nearly 400 years apart, actually go together very well because they speak of the same thing, the wonderful victory that is ours through Christ. The first hymn, the old favorite, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And the second hymn, the, I heard the old, old story of how my Savior came from glory and came and won for me the victory. We'll sing the first two stanzas of each of these wonderful hymns. Let's stand together as we sing.
Our God, as we come to this last night of revival services, we come with thanksgiving for all you've done in our lives. We come with thanksgiving for you sending to us uh, Reverend Stephen Earle. We thank you for his messages to us. And tonight, Lord, we pray that as we end these scheduled revival services, that it will not be the end, but the beginning of what you want to do in your people in this place. Open our hearts this evening to your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you be seated? Let me just take a moment to welcome you here as we continue to worship our Lord. It's good to see so many of our guests back with us again tonight. We're glad that you've been a part of the revival services here at First Baptist. This has been a wonderful week, and I want to mention a couple of people. First of all, I want to mention Mark for the wonderful job that he has done with our music and the choir for being a part of leading us in worship each evening and the handbells last night. Also, our fellowship and social committee who planned our meal this evening. All the people who've ushered and, and helped as far as the worship services each evening. We appreciate everything that everyone has done to make this week such a great success. And of course, we thank Stephen for being with us and bringing God's message to us this week. We're glad to see you tonight, and we hope tonight will be the beginning of revival and not the end. You turn your hymnals to number 483. We begin a medley of four hymns, the first three of which are ones that we have all grown up with and are very familiar with. The last of these four hymns, if you were here Sunday morning, you heard the choir sing an anthem version of this same hymn, a beautiful text written by Fanny Crosby many, many years ago. And this particular text was one of many that were lost for nearly a hundred years. Finally were published only about 20 years ago and for the first time set to music shortly thereafter. While we were familiar with many of her wonderful hymns and her poetry, her hymns continue to speak to us, and even hymns such as this, Lord, Here Am I, continue to be found and set to music and continue to inspire and challenge us. A hymn medley of commitment, footsteps of Jesus, higher ground, stand up, stand up for Jesus, and then what we hope will be the answer to God's calling this Correct. week. Master, thou callest, and this I reply, ready and willing, Lord, here am I. We'll sing the first stanza of each of these hymns.
Thank you, choir. Our scripture reading tonight is the passage we've been reading all week. It set the tone for our revival preparation and our services. Let's read it together. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I want to add two words of thanks to those already mentioned by our pastor and that to our pianist and organist, Herman and Janet Matthews. They have put in many hours this week and these instruments have seen a whole month's worth of playing done on them <laughs> just in these past four days. And uh, they have put in uh, a lot of time this week as well. And we could not have done any of it without them. And we want to say, oh, express my thanks and appreciation for them. Our next hymn tonight is a hymn of freedom in Christ. Free from the law, oh, happy condition. Jesus hath bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace has redeemed us once for all. Hymn number 332. Let's stand together as we sing of our freedom in Christ. lives reflect, O Lord, the praises that we sing. We have received grace upon grace. Let us live in grace with one another. We have received forgiveness. 
let us forgive. We have received freedom. Let us show others that they might be free. We have received gifts far beyond our need. So let us give. Bless these gifts given this day and always. Amen. This evening, again, it's my privilege to welcome to our pulpit Reverend Stephen Earle, pastor of the First Baptist Church, Ponca City, Oklahoma. I've heard so many of you uh, have come to him and come to me this week and expressed that you really feel that God sent Stephen to us this week, and I feel the same way. And we appreciate his messages every evening during these revival services. Before Stephen comes, we have a guest soloist this evening, someone that is not a stranger to you in our city and community. Karen Green Blondell, of course, is our Commonwealth attorney, but also a very devoted member of the First Christian Church here in Middlesboro. And tonight, she probably comes as Stephen's friend. So, uh, Karen, we welcome you this evening. Before I sing, I want to say a word as a member of the community at large. I want to thank this church for bringing Stephen Earle home to us. This homecoming is long overdue, and I am grateful, and many of you have I've heard say the same thing that are not members of this church, are grateful to this church for letting us share this week. I also want to say a word about Stephen Earle, and he, he really hates it when I do this. this I told his mother he wouldn't like this a bit, but I, I must do this because I want to say to you, Stephen Earle is one of my, my oldest friends, not chronologically. <laughs> we have been friends as long as I remember. We grew up just a few blocks from each other, and we grew up in similar churches and in the very same circles. And. The position we're in tonight is one we have shared more times than we could count. Sometimes it has been 
uh, in small, very small churches in small settings. I wish I could tell you about the church that Stephen pastors. I, I have had the privilege of being in Ponca City and other of his pastorates and he is so like family to me that I, I have said sometimes I almost feel like, you know, such pride when I'm in these other churches and I just want to say to them what I'm going to say to you. And I expressed this to him last night. In a world where things change and people change, and life changes, what a reassurance it is to me that Stephen Earle that you hear now, of whom we're all so proud, he's the same man that he was when we were doing revivals as teenagers, before seminary, before many successful pastorates he's had. I want you to know because I know we are close friends and he's the same Christian man that left this community as a teenager. And I said to him last night how grateful in my own life I am that some things don't change. And the conviction that Stephen Earle has is the same Steve Earle that left here. So I'm grateful that he asked me to sing. Um, and the, the very source of our friendship for these many years is the faith that we share and still share.
I don't have any old friends, by the way. <laughs> uh, I don't remember a time that I haven't known Karen, and uh, we visit by phone every few days or weeks or so. You don't let much distance get apart. Uh, and thanks. I'll pay you later if you won't take it. Uh, we have had some humorous and some wonderful experiences working together over the years in revival services. And I appreciate so much she did come to Ponca City made a special trip to stay with us, visit in our home, sing in our church, and uh, what a thrill it was for me and for our congregation to know her. And I hope you'll make another trip out there one of these days. Uh, somewhere back there, uh, I realized, came to realize, what an impact First Baptist Church Middlesboro had on my life. And uh, you may know this, or you may not, but... Uh, this city is indebted to First Baptist Middlesboro. All of us, uh, particularly who are Baptist, have been influenced by this great congregation. Uh, when I was a young man, this church was the flagship church, I guess, for this whole area. And, uh, and I realized that and saw in your ministers and in your ministry uh, the kind of person, persons, church, that churches ought to be. Several months ago, when I heard that Jeff Roberts had come to First Baptist Middlesboro, I said, hey, man, that'll work. And it is, isn't it? It is working. I didn't have any idea at that time it would afford me the opportunity to be here with you, but how deeply grateful I am for the time to be here and to celebrate with Jeff and Robin back in the choir. Uh, and also to uh, renew acquaintances with you and many people in this community that I have known over the years. Uh, it's been a thrill for me, and to get in once a year is not really often enough, but uh, thanks for letting me come home one more time during the year. Second Chronicles 7.14 has been our theme, and Jeff has already read that to you, uh, and you read it with him Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night and tonight. We have talked about every phrase of it, really. We began with healing of the land, which is our vision for revival. And as I said uh, on the very first, I'm not here to bring revival, but to help along and encourage what revival is already happening in your midst. We talked about the need for it, and then we backed up and picked up that word if and talked about the possibilities of what God can do and our responsibility to work with Him to bring those things about. We talked about those other phrases that are difficult for us to accept and commit to sometimes, humbling ourselves and praying. And last night, turning from wicked ways and how they apply to us, even as the people of God, for these scriptures were written to God's people. And tonight we get to that glorious phrase, and I will forgive their sins. That's where we've been headed all week long. On August the 28th, 1963, Martin Luther King stood on the steps of this nation's capital and preached one of the most remembered sermons ever recorded. We know it as the I Have a Dream message. Dr. King concluded his remarks that day by quoting an old spiritual that expressed the heart cry of his people, yea, the heart cry of all people who are oppressed. His words ring clearly in my mind even to this day. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty we're free. At last. One of these days, we will stand in the presence of our Lord, free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin, and free from the presence of sin. And we will all sing together, hopefully, free at last, 
free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Forgiveness is something we almost take for granted. And we use the term so lightly. I felt it would be good on this closing evening of our revival to talk about two ideas implied in 2 Chronicles 7.14. The first I call the content of forgiveness. What does it mean to be forgiven? What is involved in forgiveness? And to understand the real aspect of what God has done in Christ for us, we must first look at the enormity of our debt. We use this word in the church, sin, S-I-N, and we also treat that rather lightly. But it is a weighty word and is used both generally and specifically in the, in the Bible. In the specific sense, sin means failure, to miss the mark, to come short, to say all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a parallel statement Paul wrote, Romans 3.23. All have sinned or fallen short and fallen short of the glory of God. And when we fail to give God his due or live up to what he has made us potentially to be, we sin. But there are two other words in the general sense we sometimes find in Scripture that are much weightier. They are degrees of sin of which we have all been a part at some time. One of those is transgression. And it means to be an open rebellion against God. For God to say, do this, and we to say, not me, Lord, is to transgress. He says, for example, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you, and refusal to be kind, to be harsh with someone, is to say to God, no, I refuse to do what you said to do. I transgress your law. I will not obey you. We could go through the Old Testament and the New as well, perhaps, and pick out many of those instances, some of them very strong, others may appear quite minor, but where we would have to say, I have been in rebellion against God. For he has said, this is my will and my word to you, and we have said, no, Lord, I refuse to accept it, and will not live by those principles. Jeff, I would dare say that here this evening, if we would be honest with each other, that there are some of us who would have to confess that we have lived outside or at least nudging the edges of God's will, knowing what it is and doing otherwise. Transgression, harsh word. The other word is iniquity. And it really means to be twisted or distorted. It would describe a, a tree, for instance, if it was growing up next to a building. And instead of being able to grow out straight, the branch would grow and twist as it grows. And it looks distorted. The other day I was uh, uh, back in the mountains where I used to play as a kid and I noticed a tree where a vine had grown around it and the vine was long gone, but the tree was twisted and big nodules on the tree. It was distorted looking. And I thought as I saw that tree, that's what sin does to me and to you. It wraps its tentacles around us and sometimes after we have gotten rid of it, we still appear twisted or distorted. And as long as it has its grip on us, we are twisted and distorted. We reach the state of iniquity by allowing our failures, our sins in the specific sense, our shortcomings and our transgressions to pile up. We do not go to the Heavenly Father and receive cleansing from those and our sins and our transgressions pile up and we get twisted in our outlook, distorted in the way we think. There's a perfect example of this in the New Testament. Jesus told him a parable about two men who went to the temple to pray. One of them was a tax collector. And he was so overcome with emotion that he could hardly contain himself and he beat up on his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And standing off was a Pharisee. As far as anybody could tell, clean in character. And the Pharisee was disturbed that this old tax collector would be so audible and so such emotion in the temple that he looked down his nose and said, I thank God I'm not like that man. And Jesus said, in the eyes of God, that old tax collector who beat up on his breast and cried aloud went away justified. And the Pharisee, who thought he was so fine, left in worse condition 
Then he went in, twisted in the way he saw things, distorted in his perspective on what real religion was. When we come to Christ, whenever that may be, we come as persons who have fallen short of God's glory, as persons who have rebelled against God, transgressed His word and His law, and as persons who have been twisted and distorted because of sin in our lives. That's the debt we have. And to get rid of it is more than an erasure. Sometimes we treat it so lightly, oh, what if I do sin? God will forgive. As though forgiveness is no more than the Lord taking out a, a pen and, and erasing something beside our name in some book in eternity. Forgiveness is much weightier than that. Forgiveness is not an erasure on record. You see, a debt has to be paid by someone. Our sin debt has to be paid by someone. It cannot just be forgotten. In the Old Testament era, they practiced it like this. A person who felt the weight of sin and his guilt would bring with him a prized goat or lamb to the priest. They always brought the best. In many instances, they were not shepherds. And the lamb or the goat may be a family pet. They called them by name. They loved them. They were valuable, not only from an economic standpoint, but from a sentimental standpoint. And they would bring this little lamb or goat they had raised in their house and present it to the priest and lay their hands on its head. And the priest would say the blessing. And then they would release the lamb or the goat out into the wilderness. They allowed it to escape into the wilderness, knowing good and well that the lamb or goat could not survive in the wilderness. It would be exposed to the elements and to the wild beast until its life was finally taken. And the worshiper would stand there with his hands on that animal's head, regretting that his sin had brought him to this point, and yet somehow grateful that he could be relieved of his guilt. And he would walk away from the temple knowing that the, that the lamb his children had played with was carrying his guilt off into the wilderness, somewhere, some way to die. This is where we get the word scapegoat. Somebody else takes our blame. Someone else carries our guilt. Well, you see the parallel already, don't you? Jesus was our scapegoat. He came in our place. He bore the weight of our sin, our transgression, our iniquity. The Bible says God has laid on Him the sins of us all. Though He was innocent and pure and clean. And God knew when He came, He could not survive. When He carried our sin, He could not survive. That some point in time, He would die for our sin. Then we tend to say, oh... That happened 2,000 years ago, and sure it is effective today, but so what? The book of Hebrews says that we who have known the grace of God, yet when we rebel and go back on Him, we crucify the Son of God anew. In the heart of God, Christ is crucified when we sin. Eternity is timeless. We measure things in minutes and seconds and minutes and hours and weeks and years. In God's heart, in God's sight, it is timeless. Life is an ongoing event. And according to Hebrews, when we willfully, who know to do right, choose to do wrong, we again anew crucify His Son. Forgiveness is a weighty matter. The context of forgiveness is also something we must consider greatly. For when we read about it in the Scripture, we discover that it is not so simple as you and me going along to the Savior and receiving forgiveness, even though it is so costly. If you noticed in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, all the pronouns are third person plural. God did not say, 
I will forgive his or her sin and heal his or her land. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. This same principle is taught in the Lord's Prayer. Did you notice that all the pronouns are plural? Our Father, not my Father. Our Father. Our daily bread. Our debts. And our debtors. The little book of 1 John ties it together pretty neatly. John says that we who walk in the light have fellowship with Him, that is Christ, with God. And that we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. Forgiveness takes place in the context of the community of faith. It is not something we can get without giving. And the church is here to proclaim forgiveness in Christ and to experience it in the context of Christianity. There is no way that we can ever hope to or expect to receive complete forgiveness from God if we withhold it from other people. This is a very hard lesson for us to learn. And it's not because God is unwilling to forgive us. God is willing to forgive us at any time we come to Him. But when we build a barrier between us and other people, we automatically build a barrier between us and God. Because you see, God resides in the hearts of other people as well. And the love of God extends to other persons as well. To forgive and to be forgiven means we go to the cross And as we lay our sins before Christ, we take those sins that have been committed against us and we lay those before Him too. If there's anything that I think is a a real problem in today's church, it revolves around this idea of forgiveness because we preach it but we do not practice it. Every one of us here probably could name someone we know who has fallen away, fallen short, got caught up in sin, committed some wrong. And the church stands off and howls or hurts or condemns or complains. When Paul clearly said, if any one of you is overtaken in a fault, those who are spiritual, go to such a one and restore him in a spirit of meekness. But instead, we want to hold it against them and hold it over their heads. And we have people all around our churches who are hurting from what sin has done to them, distorted, twisted, would like to be set free, would love to be cleansed. But in our midst, they feel condemned rather than accepted. They feel as though we are better than they and we are condemning them. When in fact, we should be the proclaimers of grace that we have received and share that with them abundantly. Jeff, Perry Sanders is a... Do you know Perry Sanders? He's an old Louisiana boy and uh, he's preaching in a revival down in southern Mississippi and uh, he was getting a drink of water and he overheard two women talking at the water fountain. And one of them said, Do you know that our WMU director won't even bow her head when the chairman of deacons prays? And he thought, My, it's no wonder we can't have revival here. So he decided, he said, I'm going to work that into the sermon some way tonight. I don't know how, but I'm going to work that into the sermon. And uh, sure enough, he got up in the pulpit, or, and before the service started, he leaned over the pastor and he said, Ask the chairman of deacons to pray tonight. And the pastor, he didn't know why. He didn't know what was going on, and he didn't know, even know this situation existed. And uh, so the pastor got up and called on the chairman of deacons. Instead of bowing his head, Perry Sanders just watched. And sure enough, this lady stood out there and cleaned her fingernails. <laughs> she did. So he said he got preaching big way in the sermon, and he said, you folks know something? I heard of a church one time where the WMU director wouldn't even bow her head when the chairman of deacons prayed. He said, boy, you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, it was like, oh! Came to the conclusion of the sermon. And down one aisle walked the chairman of deacons. And down the other aisle walked the WMU director. And they embraced 
and they knelt and they wept and God blessed. I'm glad you're not in that situation. But unless this is a very unusual gathering, there are people who are carrying baggage around. Somewhere along the way, somebody said something. Somewhere along the way, there's been a hurt. Somewhere along the way, something has been done that you just cannot get over. And it becomes a barrier in our relationship to the Lord and in our service to Him and for other people. And to understand the true meaning of forgiveness is not to say he or she really is in debt to God, he or she sinned, he or she hurt me, but to understand that all of us have been guilty of sin, transgression, and iniquity, that all of us have been distorted in the eyes of God. And if it were not for His grace, all of us would be doomed to eternity without Him. And forgiveness is to say, Lord, for me and these, I pray and accept forgiveness. I told you about Nehemiah, didn't I? Who fell on his face and prayed that I will confess my sins and the sins of my fathers. And that's the position we need to be in. is to come before God, seeking for ourselves forgiveness and the ability to forgive and seeking for others the same forgiveness we want for ourselves. Many years ago, Alexander Pope wrote an essay on criticism, and he made a statement in that, wrote a statement in that you're quite familiar with. He said, to err is human, to forgive is divine. What I want to ask you this evening is to allow God to do a divine work in your heart to give you forgiveness and give you the ability to grant it to others. Would you accept it? And will you grant it? Let's stand for the invitation. Again, our hymn is 294. 294. In just a moment, your pastor will be standing here to greet those who would like to come. I offer the invitation for those who would like to receive forgiveness for past and present sin. Maybe you've never accepted Christ. You're not a Christian, but you'd like to be. You'd like to know Christ. You'd like to have eternal life. You'd like to know the abundant life. We offer that to you tonight. I offer the invitation for those who would say, Pastor, I am a Christian. And I made a decision to serve God years ago, or maybe months ago, or maybe weeks ago. But somewhere along the way, I've allowed those barriers to be erected. And my life is not clean with God, nor is it clean with other people. And you would like to leave tonight cleansed, clean before God, before people. You may want to share that with your pastor. You may want to kneel on this altar and pray and settle it with God alone. But if you're not clean and you want to be, you come tonight. Others may be here who would like to join the church and say, I want to be counted among the members at First Baptist Church who are committed to living for Christ and reaching this community with the gospel. They'll be glad to receive you. If it's to trust Christ as your Savior, recommit your life to Him. Come clean before him and before others. For to join this church, you come while we sing, will you?
I wouldn't want you to think that if you answer the invitation tonight, people are going to look at you and say, oh, what has he done or said? Or what has she done? Or who are they at odds with? People are not going to think that at all. But even if they do, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is what God thinks. Years ago, I was troubled about something that had been said about me that wasn't true. And my dad won't remember this, but he said to me, son, it really doesn't matter what people say, think, or do because you can't control it anyway. So don't worry about it, but do what you know is right. Don't be afraid of what someone else may think, say, or do if you respond to the invitation. Do what's right. Do what you know in your heart God asks you to do this evening. Will you? Stephen, we thank you for your message tonight, and we thank you for what you've said to us all week long. And we have taken to heart God's message for us this week, and we do pray that as we end this time of revival services, that this will just be the beginning of what God is doing in this place and in this community. Tonight, for our parting song, we're going to sing our theme song for the week, and as we sing it, may it be our prayer as we continue to seek God's face and to serve him. After we sing, I'm going to ask Stephen to come down front with me to give you a chance to greet him and express your gratitude to him for being with us this week. Let's mark. <laughs> 